Hello everyone, uh, today we're sitting here with Drum uh, and we're going to talk about some challenges that he came across uh, while developing Silica. Uh, hello Drum. Hello. Um, I would like to ask you, um, why did you decide to use the authentic scale in Silica? So the authentic scale was chosen to kind of put across the scale of the world. The vehicles being large and so on kind of gives a very um, interesting feel, one that I really wanted. It was a feel which uh, I recall in uh, seeing in like the, the images in Dune 2, for example, where you saw that the, that the vehicles were very large relative to the troops. And uh, I wanted to portray that in Silica. All right. Were there any complications related to the large buildings? Uh, yes, there was plenty of complications, actually. Or one of them was, for example, building placement. Uh, placement on the terrain, especially because the terrain is not flat, it's of course, you know, very much, uh, uh, very much alive, one could say. Then, uh, uh, then, it, then it was quite complicated to write a system where it would be able to snap to the terrain without having a part of it floating in the air. And uh, the way I solved that was to kind of define points on the building which had to be beneath ground and points which had to be above ground. So if all of the points were been, like under the ground, that, that were meant to be under the ground, and the other ones were above the ground, then it was a valid position. Um, of course, you could move the, the building up and down to kind of like fit that. Uh, and then I uh, had some like entries which had to be clear and so on. But yeah, that was one of the major problems. Uh, some other ones were, for example, recalculating the navigation graph um, around the building when it was placed. Uh, or when it was destroyed, of course, because of course, you know, uh, the vehicles have to avoid the buildings, troops have to be able to walk on the buildings themselves, and so on. So th these are just some of the um, issues that were encountered uh, with the large buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, when the buildings are building, there's this kind of like system of, let's say, lights uh, that the people can see in Silica. Can you describe a little bit more of that? Why did you chose like chosen that kind of uh, system? Mm -hmm. uh, I assume you mean the, con the construction system, which, uh, which is the fabrication technique, so to speak. Uh, so being perfectly honest, the reason I chose that was because it was the most technically feasible for um, the massive team size. Um, uh, uh, I'm saying that ironically, of course. Um, but basically it was, it was very simple to set up because I had these prefabs which were like sh uh, square shaped. So I could then just like, con like cover the building. Um, and therefore do it so that they progressively appear, you know, cover the whole area where the building will be present, and then pop the building in under that, it wouldn't be visible, and then slowly get rid of that. And then therefore you could see the building like, it looks correct, where the building kind of like builds up and then disappears, like the, the, the kind of supports. It was inspired a lot by, of course, you know, 3D printing techniques, which are, you know, current as well. Um, the world of Silica is physics driven. Can you maybe explain why did you choose that? Like if it was necessary or uh, if it was a good route to go? So that, that one, that's a very um, uh, interesting issue. I remember when I was doing Take on Mars, uh, I was very convinced and I did a post-mortem on that, uh, presented the other project leads in the company, uh, where I very specifically stated that it's a bad idea to do everything physics driven. <laughs> Evidently I went back on that. Um, but the, the reason at the time was mainly because processes were slow and because it adds a ton of issues. But in fact, thanks to the, um, uh, to the experience I had with Take on Mars, uh, it was actually much more easy for me to go with everything physics driven. Um, namely, vehicles doing non-physics driven vehicles, like where the actual hull and so on are not actually driven by uh, uh, like Newtonian physics, uh, is a bad idea because it makes it very difficult. You have to snap it to the terrain somehow. So it might look very strange or it might look unnatural the way the vehicle moves, especially if it goes over a dune, you would expect to kind of like crop over a little bit and otherwise you'd have to simulate physics to a degree. Uh, so therefore I chose to use physics and uh, I actually had to use uh, convex colliders for the very large vehicles, specifically their tires or, or their, their wheels because uh, I, I didn't think about it at the beginning, but when I, did, when I did choose to use large vehicles, the thing I forgot about is that you know, in, in a standard vehicle implementation, you would use kind of, you'd have a specialized wheel collider, which would, which would have simulation of uh, friction and spinning and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, the problem with this is that it's great for vehicles where the tire is smaller than a human. It doesn't work very well for very large vehicles because you can walk under the, under the wheel and so on. And there's a situation where, for example, if you have this kind of a, a blockage and the vehicle is meant to drive over it, this simulation usually results in a kind of like jump up on top, which would look very incorrect for the harvester, which has gigantic wheels, which need to actually roll over the top of it. So 
uh, this is something that would be very difficult to achieve with anything other than physics. I mean, you could do it with like, you know, sphere cast and so on, but it would be very complicated and it would just cost about the same performance as running physics on it. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe a little bit more how you approach the colliders? I know that you mentioned it a little bit, but like, for example, some colliders in the buildings as well as the place. Mm -hmm. So the colliders, because uh, because it's FPS and RTS, I couldn't take the route of uh, having simplified colliders. Simplified in the sense that, you know, you have, for example, pipes, and you can see through them because they're hollow, um, uh, but, you know, the, the collider would just cover the whole thing. Because there is the FPS element, and these pipes are large, so you could theoretically shoot through them, uh, or, or, for example, trusses. You know, there's, there's individual, like, layers in them, so you have to be able to shoot through them, or, like, through the areas uh, between the metal, metallic parts, because, it's just what a play would expect in an FPS. And if it just bounced off the side of it, that would look very strange and be very unpleasant because you wouldn't, it's, you wouldn't fulfill the expectations of the players of the world from an FPS perspective. And quite frankly, it's also very interesting to, to, to have these accurate colliders and things bounce where they're meant to and so on. Um, and because there is realistic ballistics, there is uh, ricochets, or th there are ricochets for the projectiles, there, are, uh, there is penetration and so on as well. So, uh, you know, it's very important to have realistic colliders for this reason. Mm -hmm. uh, were there some other challenges maybe connected with it, like while implementing that? Yes, uh, one, one of the challenges is like uh, having complex colliders makes it, uh, or more specifically, the more complex the colliders are, the bigger the problem is, uh, for example, to update nav the nav mesh. It just takes longer because it has to voxelize the actual, uh, the actual collider and so on. And so when it has to voxelize the collider, that takes much more time than, uh, than if it was just a simple box, for example. So these are the challenges where you have to make complex colliders, but not too complex, because then it runs into to performance issues, for example, for, for the um, uh, nav mesh regeneration, not on recalculation, sorry. Uh, uh, not only that, but of course, the more complex the colliders are, then for example, the crabs walking on them will just take up more performance because you know, th there's much more physics, physics calculations going into actually calculating the movement or the, colli the collisions on the collider. So uh, yeah, th there are, there are like, these kind of issues mainly. Going back to the realistic ballistics as well uh, and the ricochet and stuff like that, you can very well see it when you slow down the time. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe explain a little bit like how can that result, why people are like shooting, you know, in a, in a fast paced, um, let's say game or fast paced action. How does that like um, influence the, the actual game? Like what they can see some example. Mm -hmm. So you can see it, for example, when tanks are fighting against each other, especially at range. Uh, you shoot at a tank and it tends to, let's say, uh, of course not the railgun tank, that has a different time, type, of, uh, uh, type of shell, but for standard shells, it'll bounce off the top of the armor. You know, and you'll see that kind of, that, that, that metallic kind of like the, the sparks and so on, and you're like, ah, I didn't hit it correctly. Um, uh, it influences gameplay quite heavily because it means that there's the tactics you, tactics you would expect, for example, in, uh, in War Thunder for, um, uh, for the tanks, for example. So you, you, there's tactics with angling the tank, so you have the, the flat sides of the armor uh, you know, towards the enemy, not presenting a flat side which can be penetrated correctly, like uh, relatively easily. Uh, because if it's, of course, you know, directly, then, it's going, then the shell is going to penetrate and do much more damage than, um, than if it was at an angle where it would, for example, either ricochet or it would explode onto, on the surface. Still do a little bit of damage, but not enough to, to like, take out the tank. And there are, there are, of course, weak points. So under the turret, for example, there's the, the neck, you could say. If you hit that, that does a lot of damage uh, and so on. So, yeah, th there's these kind of tactics which, which come into play with the realistic ballistics. Well, and with the bullet ricochets, um, for example, can it hit some of the target? Yeah, yeah, of course it can. Uh, as soon as it ricochets, there's also simulation on whether the, uh, the projectile is deformed. So a uh, tank shell, if it gets deformed from the ricochet, because it can be a very slight ricochet, in which case it does not get deformed. And what you might get is, it, for example, if you have a front part of the armor and over here you have the turret and there's the neck, you can kind of like ricochet it very slightly up into the neck off the front of the tank. Um, it's a very, very long shot, let's say, but it can happen. It has happened to me multiple times. Uh, uh, against me, of course, it never happens to me. But anyway, um, uh, but yes, this does play a role. This does play a role. Uh, in the sense that you, like if the bullet bounces or the, the, the shell, for example, does bounce at too strong an angle, it will start spinning. It does go into like a, a proper spinning. The, the spin of the projectile is also simulated. 
So it will kind of like get into this kind of like spiral and spiral off and it can hit someone and still do uh, impact damage, but it won't explode because it's been deformed and uh, it just can't explode anymore. That's very interesting because like, like people are playing, uh, they can experience these like strange scenarios, but it's good to know that they're actually like quite realistic. Mm -hmm. um, Going back to the aliens, you mentioned that like while they're climbing the colliders and stuff like that, they can also climb each other and form these kind of like big swarms. Uh, can you share a little bit like why did you decide that they can do that and how is that done, let's say, in the engine or like... Uh... Mm -hmm. So uh, the thing with the aliens and being able to swarm, uh, this was one thing why uh, going with physics was a good idea. Because doing this with anything but physics just makes it very complicated to do. Uh, because you do, you have to do sphere casts, and then you have to kind of like go and you basically simulate physics. So there's no no real point to it. The way the actual uh, the aliens work, they actually have a sphere collider, which there's no there's no ray cast or anything like that apart from footsteps because I have to of course detect the footsteps. Um, uh, but other than that, they actually just literally are a ball moving on the terrain and reacting to the terrain. So when I when it bumps into something, especially on the ground, for example, you know it gets the the normal of that and it knows which direction is up you could you could say so if there's a point beneath and a point like this where it runs into a wall then uh, when it runs into the wall it knows that you know the input that i'm giving it is forward into the wall so logically this is the more important direction than this one so therefore it starts to angle angle up and then it goes up the wall uh, uh, and the important thing is yes they can climb over each other but they can't climb onto each other just by themselves it would have to be like that there's that there's more of them and then they get kind of pushed but they can climb over the top I've got simulation of, um, or oh, simulation, I've got limitations to the movement because before what was happening, they could literally climb on top of each other, which was really fun. But what would happen is two crabs would climb on top of each other and then they just kind of go into a spiral into it and they'd go into, they'd have a basically alien space program. But, um, but, but what I've done here is uh, I've limited it so they can't climb on top of each other, um, but they can only go if it's relative to gravity, I think within what, 10, 15 degrees or something like that. I, I, uh, uh, I, f I forget exactly. But um, uh, so if they're on top of each other, they can climb on top of each other, but they can't climb up onto each other. Yes. Um, and therefore, when there's a lot of them, they just naturally push each other on top and it creates this big pile, which, which looks really good, of course. Um, uh, but yeah, it's one big advantage of using physics for this. Since you're mentioning that they can kind of like push up, um, the community knows that there's going to be air units. Does that have some advantage, let's say, against the uh, air units? It does, technically speaking, um, because, again, because everything is running on physics, then uh, uh, the crab, if it cra catches onto an air vehicle, it naturally applies, you know, a downforce because of its weight. So if there's, let's say, three crabs that jump onto a very light air vehicle, they will pull it down to the ground. Um, uh, I think I've shown that in, I've, I've shown it in multiple kind of like online streams uh, uh, with, for example, the Dead Wizard or Lycan and so on. And uh, in these streams, I, I showed it where I, where I spawned a ton of them, let's say 300 of them. And uh, I had a flying air vehicle and they kind of tried to attack that and they would just kind of like jump up here and there. Then one would catch on and then a second one would catch on and then they pull it down into the big pile and then it's gone, of course. You know, it kind of like disappears into the pile. Um, but yeah, they do apply correct weight and so on. That's the advantage of the physics in this regard. Uh, and so it is usable against the air units, but I mean, quite frankly, you know, if, if your air units are sitting on the ground, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but they should be able to land, especially so players can, can take them. Not only that, but also so they can hide. If they're in the air, they're an easier target, of course. That said, I will one mention one last thing. And uh, the plan is so that aliens actually get the first air units. Simple, like uh, not, not very powerful, but uh, the advantage of that would be that once the humans get air units, these ones could swarm that air unit and in fact drag it down to the ground because it'll land on top of it and it'll fall to the ground, for example. But we'll see how that goes. I'm still implementing it, so. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to bring some very good action uh, in all the bathrooms. Uh, cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the multiplayer synchronization? How is that approached? Why did you chose that approach and how does it work? I went against the standard tactic of using, for example, replication, or what you could call it that, which is that it's all entirely server-side. The reason for this is uh, because, it, and you just send differences in the world. The reason is because it's a lot of data. And when, once there's a huge amount of units, then that, that causes a problem in synchronization. It requires a lot of data to synchronize. Uh, and it means you do have to synchronize at a very large tick rate. You know, so for example, uh, with uh, with Counter Strike, you know, you're getting 120 hertz servers, 
uh, where in silica it's five hertz. It only synchronizes five times per second. You know, so it's a massive difference in in uh, in uh, in the approach for synchronization. The advantage of that and the reason for that I think is more important is because I went with client hosted service you know listen server so I can host a game and I can play with my friends they can join my uh, uh, join my server um, and if it required a really strong connection like a really powerful like really large bandwidth for that then it would really limit who can actually start a server um, uh, or it would really limit how much units they can have in the server. So my, my, my goal was always to go with around 100 to 200 units maximum in the game. Um, I did not put a unit cap in, and so it resulted in, of course, everyone spawning about 500 to 600, you know, even more. So uh, I have been working on uh, optimizing that in terms of performance, but I will also be working on uh, optimizing that in terms of bandwidth. Because right now when there's 600 units, it's a lot of data that has to be sent. You know, but I think that kind of like speaks for itself. You know, uh, uh, that you can basically synchronize 600 units uh, over the net. You know, it's, it's, um, it is a lot to synchronize, um, especially when they're all in one group. You know, you, you have to be able to kind of handle 600 units, uh, for example, 600 units, if that's the amount you can build, you know, um, uh, of course, with error correction and so on. Right. But the, the main reason was I wanted to limit how much bandwidth is required for it. Um, especially because I've gone with physics for everything, it means that uh, everything does have have to sim like uh, synchronize uh, linear velocity, so just like you know positional uh, or directional velocity, and then angular velocity as well. That's two vectors. That's already quite a lot of data. And then plus position and rotation. You know the, the rotation you can kind of like break the quaternion down into just four bytes, for example. But um, uh, nonetheless, you still have to you still have to synchronize that. So. It's, um, it's a lot of data and per unit, you know, and you really can't reduce that all that much without impacting the individual unit. So for, for example, with the swarm, yeah, that could work. You can kind of like limit that down and kind of like, you know, recalculate it, so to speak. But, uh, you know, if it's an individual unit, you will notice that it's, a, that it's causing problems. So yeah, mainly that, just the amount of units really made me limit how much that gets, uh, uh, is, is to be synchronized. And a more important point, and this is a more uh, funny one actually, um, I wanted to uh, uh, support really high ping rates, right? So my brother lives, uh, I, w I, uh, I was born in the Czech Republic, grew up in Australia. My brother is still in Australia, I'm here in the Czech Republic. And, uh, you know, I, I like to play the game with him. And he, when, whenever we play anything, there's a 300 millisecond ping. Uh, so it makes it extremely impractical to play anything with him online. Um, and so I wanted to support this kind of a high ping rate, like high ping, you know, high ping, so to speak. And so uh, this system allows for that because I did do client side hit detection. But the, uh, so the approach is in fact old school, you could say. And uh, of course, the old school thing which you have to do to that is uh, sanity checks. Because I've noticed now that there's a lot of hackers which have been showing up, you know, where, they, where they've, of course, you know, decompiled the game and they found out how the packets are, are, are built and so on. And so they send it much faster than they should. So I need to do sanity checks. Oh, you're sending much more damage packets than you should be. Oh, you're moving faster than you should be and so on and order ban them. And the big challenge also was the fog of war for FPS and RTS. Uh, how did you approach that and why did you choose that approach that is in the game? Mm -hmm. So from a standard RTS, one would expect, of course, fog of war. Whatever in the fog of uh, whatever's uh, outside of the vision, active vision or units specifically that are outside of the vision range in the fog of war would be concealed, right? They would just not be visible. Uh, that, of course, causes problems with um, with FPS where it's just, you know, line of sight, essentially, right? Um, and at the same time, I couldn't use line of sight for RTS because if you have a cliff face, because I have, you know, really uh, plastic terrain, really 3D terrain, then if you have, for example, a cliff face and you have a crab on top, then his line of sight ends on the, on the edge of the cliff. And if you have a unit down here, it's revealed by the fog of war. It should be revealed by the fog of war, but you have no line of sight. So, you know, I, I would expect as an FPS player that, uh, uh, or as an FPS player, I would expect not to see it to a degree. But from an RTS perspective, I would most certainly expect to see it. So I kind of went with um, a, uh, this was the only kind of, this, this is the only point where I kind of did, had to do kind of like, you know, the best of both worlds. So I added in a uh, thing which I call concealment, right? Uh, uh, so there's the vision range of the fog of war and anything within that in the, in the, like out in the open is revealed. So under the cliff, if it's, if it's not, directly near the cliff, but it's somewhere, somewhere here, and there's a unit here, it will be revealed. 
but uh, units can be concealed if they're near, for example, large rocks, cliffs, and so on. Uh, and of course, it depends. It changes from unit to unit. So you cannot hide, for example, a hover tank which is actively hovering because its thrusters are very clearly visible. Um, and so there's, there's multiple ways a unit can be detected with, via audio. So if it's just standing on the spot with just, you know, idle engine, let's say a light quad, then it's not going to be heard from a distance. If it starts shooting, it's going to be much more audible. So just the audible range can reveal a unit. But for, let's say, let's go with just soldiers, for example, because those are much more, they're, they're very small relative to everything else, um, and uh, they can be hidden quite well. So they might be near a cliff. If a crab is on top, they can't see, he can't see the, um, uh, the, uh, the soldier, which is hiding near the cliff. That soldier is considered concealed, and even though the fog of war clearly would, should kind of reveal him, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't expect, from an RTS perspective, if I have my crab here, and he's not directly looking at the, at the soldier, I would not expect to see a soldier hiding in the cliff there. So, uh, but as soon as a crab goes over the cliff and starts walking down it and has a direct line of sight, then it does get revealed. And there, of course, like, there's of course a visibility, visibility algorithm. So if the soldier's you know, staying put, not moving, then it's gonna be much harder to, to kind of uh, detect him there, uh, rather than if, if the soldier started running around, shooting and so on. So, uh, and that applies to outside of the vision range within the fog of war. So if I have, again, that same, same crab on top of the cliff and I have a uh, tank outside of that range, of which is, the, let's say the view range is about here, I have a tank just, just over here, then that crab might have a direct line of sight and will therefore detect that, uh, that tank, despite it being outside of the fog of war. And of course, you know, it gets multiplied when he starts shooting and so on. So, so that's, that's the kind of um, uh, compromise I went with, uh, and it works quite well. I mean, I haven't had any feedback indicating that it was strange that something got detected or anything like that. There have been situations where, for example, a building got detected across the map. This is just a, a bug which I need to fix. I really like this approach to be thorough personally, so I think it works really well. And since uh, nobody's complaining, then I think that they're happy with it as well. Um, there must have been a lot of gameplay challenges as well. Could you walk us through a couple of them that kind of also like explain? One of the gameplay challenges was especially at the beginning of the game, and that is still a challenge, to be perfectly fair. Um, uh, when the game starts, specifically I'm talking about strategy mode, of course. When the game starts, uh, especially on the really large map, so the, the, the normal size map is three by three kilometers, uh, while the larger ones are six by six. And uh, especially on those, if, if the two teams start at opposite ends, then uh, you know, th there's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, before, when you were just running around as a soldier, it could be um, frustrating getting across that kind of a distance, especially when, for example, you'd go, you know, you get in a car and so on, you'd go get into combat and then you die, you, re you respawn at base. And at that point, you'd have to make your way back. And if there was no vehicle around, you'd have to go on foot or just wait. And that was what was happening. And uh, so I introduced, it's part of the law as well, is, uh, is teleportation. Right? In fact, the idea is that teleportation enabled this whole war in the first place, right? It enabled people to get to Bolterus. But, lore aside, um, uh, in the game, I introduced teleportation for the, for the humans. Now, teleportation, it, ha it, has, uh, it has limits, and I still have to kind of like go and probably add more limits because it can get abused and so on. But the idea is that you can teleport as long as your other units can see there, you can teleport there. That's, that's the current state. That might change in the future, depending on feedback and so on. Um, but the further away you are from the source, the greater the uncertainty radius. This is part of the law. Um, and so when you teleport there, you might say, let's say you teleport one kilometer, then you'd have an uncertainty radius of about one tenth of that distance, which is 100 meters. And therefore, you know, that, that, that can put you off from your, dr where you say, I want to teleport here, right next to this rocket launcher, which I want to jump into. And you'd get teleport 100 meters away from that. And of course, that means you have to get to it, but 100 meters is no problem. It is a problem if you're under fire. <laughs> so that's the idea of it, right? Um, that's, that was one of the gameplay challenges. Um, and of course, you know, unit count uh, or being able to kind of like make a difference as an, as an FPS player. Um, you know, th that's been one contentious issue. It's like, how can I make a difference as an FPS player? I mean, if, if you're a scout with an SMG and you're in late game, you're not going to make much of a difference, quite frankly, unless you get in a vehicle. But that's the whole idea. You select a loadout, you select a much heavier loadout, and then you can sure as hell make a difference. So, and of course, jumping in the vehicles, a player will always be better than the AI. 
there's a also day and night cycle. Um, can you also explain like what perks does it bring and basically why you also decided to go with that? I went with the day and night cycle mainly because it just felt natural. Um, and I was playing around and I didn't want to just limit it to, because basically because I was doing the locations, I didn't want to do baked lighting because they're so huge, doing baked lighting would be insane. So uh, I decided to put in a day night cycle because it just felt natural. And also because I wanted to have a certain advantage for aliens during the night. So that humans have advantages in the day, aliens have an advantage in the night. Um, uh, and that was what I, what I wanted to go with, and that's why I decided to put in the day-night cycle. I actually did it so that the day makes up about, what, 60 or 70% of the time, and then night makes up, takes up only 30 to 40%. I, I forget exactly right now. But, uh, but basically, night is accelerated. And the, the idea is because everyone was complaining that the night took too long. Um, uh, and it is, it is a bit more, um, like, yeah, sure, you have night vision and so on, but it's, it's, it is just uh, more interesting during the day. But the nighttime kind of makes it more interesting for the aliens because they kind of like can see further, they can hide better in the shadows and so on, whereas the humans cannot. Um, and so, or well, the specific of the vehicles cannot, the humans of course can. Um, uh, so yeah, mainly that was, that was why, gameplay and of course effect. You know, that kind of that feeling when you got the sun rising in the distance. Uh, and it also, you get a feeling of time passing. You know, it's, it's, it, you kind of do get that. It's, for some reason, it's very satisfying when there's a big battle happening against you, right? Or, or if you're fighting for the enemy, then that feeling of, oh, we're going into the second day. You know, you, that you're fighting, it goes from day into nighttime, you're still fighting. And then, you know, you push off the enemy and the sun starts rising. It's that like, oh, survive that, you know, survive that one day, survive till morning. So it adds that kind of like goal, all right, you know, night, night time is coming or, and, and whatever. And another thing which it also influences and uh, is, you know, the sun in the background, if you attack with the sun to your back, it's going to be much harder for the players going the opposite direction to be able to attack you because they, it's, it's difficult to see against the sun. The sun is very strong intentionally. It's a gameplay, uh, gameplay thing. I might may tweak it just a little bit, not so it's not that strong. But the idea is that it should play a role in the, uh, uh, in the game itself. You know, going against the sun, especially on Boltrus, which is meant to be scorched by the sun. You know, it's meant to be over 100 degrees Celsius on the surface of the planet. Then uh, that's the idea, that it's meant to be hot. Does it also break some downsides, maybe, like, to, I don't know, performance or even just, like, in the gameplay? You mentioned it a little bit, but mm -hmm. you can have also. In terms of performance, uh, you know, real-time dy dynamic lighting is always a little bit more um, expensive than, uh, than static baked lighting. But again, like I mentioned here, it was just a problem to do proper baked lighting um, uh, because, because just because of the main, the, 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 just the size of the locations. Um, that's, that's, that's one thing. And uh, the, the second thing is also was just because I couldn't do baked lighting properly. I, you can do it to a degree, but I just wanted to kind of avoid it for, for various reasons. And uh, it just made, it just felt more natural, quite frankly. You know, the, the sun staying in the sky constantly at the same location is a little bit boring, you know. Um, and uh, it, was, it was one of the kind of like unique factors with this. Where I, I really like, for example, in Warcraft 3, you know, that, that feeling when you're like, you, you're fighting in the day and then suddenly, you know, you'd hear the you know, it would go into nighttime. Then that was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, you felt progression in the world. And uh, I wanted to kind of like replicate that feel. But it was, it was actually not that difficult to put in. I mean, literally I had a day-night cycle done in like, what, two or three days. Um, but then it was mainly about tweaking the lighting, you know, because I did do realistic darkness, um, just literally by the, um, uh, by the brightness levels. And it was just too dark, so I had to kind of like boost it. And it's like, oh, you know, it looks a bit strange if you have a moon like ours, and uh, you know, and it casts a massively bright light. So I decided to kind of like make, okay, it's an ice moon because our our, our moon has a very low albedo. It's very dark. If you literally saw um, Earth and the moon next to each other, it's not white. It's it's very dark. It's more like ash. Um, so. I decided to go with an ice moon, right, which is much brighter, has a much higher albedo, and therefore reflects much more light, uh, and therefore makes much more sense that it's very bright during the night. So that's the way I solved it. That's quite perfect, actually. Uh, the, that makes a lot of sense. Were there some challenges connected with ammunition, and basically why you decided also to go with uh, what's in the game? Ammunition is a good point. Um, I wanted to differentiate it, like, because I, I like realism, but I didn't want to go overboard because then it just becomes a mod of armor, you could say. And then it would make more sense to do it as a mod of armor. Uh, here I wanted to kind of like 
reduce what was needed for logistics, for example. You know, because if you add ammunition, add limited fuel, then the vehicle, you know, a, a vehicle driving to the enemy and oh, sorry man, I'm running out of fuel. You're gonna have to send me back to base or you're gonna have to bring some canisters to, to refill. Or ammunition, same thing. All right, you run out of ammunition in the vehicle. What, and they have to return to base to, re, to, to, uh, to uh, you know, resupply. And it's, you know, it could be six kilometers in the worst case. So it was kind of a natural choice to avoid um, limited ammunition to a degree, but also, and this was more important for me, it was the thing you see in armor because it's realistic. And, uh, and this, is, this makes sense, that's armor, right? Is people shooting at each other from range, you're just not gonna send random shots down range. You're gonna be much more precise because you, you have to be careful. Weapons are very precise, of course, um, and limited ammunition. So you just can't go and like fill the forest with lead, so to speak, you know, you're gonna, watch oh there's an enemy send bullets down that way uh here because I, I want to kind of like more oriented towards action um and get an authentic feeling while not going overboard with realism uh i decided to not have infinite ammunition for this for one of the main reasons and therefore what happens is if, if i'm for example flying around with a vehicle right and i know i'm talking about flying vehicles of all things but uh, uh but or, or just driving around with a tank to make it more uh, current I'm driving around with the tank and I see an enemy. I think I see an enemy. I'm not sure. I haven't detected him properly. So if I look on the map, it's, he hasn't been detected. But I think I saw something there. You know, I'm, I'm just going to, oh crap, you know, I'll just shoot something in that direction because I'm not sure. Uh, and, you know, and for the other person, because he, you know, there's bullets flying his way, he's like, oh crap, crap, crap. You know, it kind of increase, adds that stress factor, but uh, makes it more fun for both sides. It's fun to shoot and it's fun to be shot at. You know, because in, uh, uh, if it's too realistic in terms of the precision, which I would expect in 2351, you know, if, if we had World War II uh, levels of precision, that would be quite pathetic, right? But, um, uh, but this kind of fits into the law to a degree because people were actually meant to have, uh, people were meant to have like disabled uh, or like dismantled all armies and stuff because they were, they were peaceful. You know, they uh, invented teleportation in 2351 and then uh, colonized, uh, uh, you know, uh, Proxima Centauri or a planet near Proxima Centauri called Centaurus because of the, um, uh, the constellation. And uh, so there was no need for war at the time because people were just working together. Then they discovered Bolterus and then, of course, they discovered Bolterium and people can be greedy. And therefore, suddenly, or more specifically, the, the aliens attacked humans there and suddenly you need, you need weapons. And, you know, everything was dismantled. There was no need for an army, military, and whatever. And suddenly you get to the point, okay, we have to reestablish a like a, 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 an arm of the military. So you kind of take the weapons which you had previously and you kind of, you know, reestablish, retrain, and so on. That was the idea behind this as well, to kind of like fit into that. But mainly it was more about the gameplay. I wanted a lot of uh, projectiles to be flying down range. I didn't want to have it so there's like nothing. Bang, a guy dies. Bang, a guy dies because... It's, it's, it's not as fun for, um, uh, for the scale, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's not exactly difficult to hit a gigantic harvester with, you know, a machine gun because it, you're not going to miss. I mean, if you miss, you stop playing, <laughs> you know, but uh, like with a machine gun, of course. Um, but that's the thing. It's, it just felt much more fun, in my opinion, shooting at someone at range with, um, especially when they shoot at you as well. You know, you kind of get that, oh, shit, 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 you've got to hide somewhere. Uh, that kind of a feeling rather than just, oh, then you're dead. Were there some other challenges connected with the commander versus infantry, let's say? That's a good point. Uh, commander versus infantry. So, of course, from an inf infantry perspective, you, standard FPS um, or standard FPS controls more specifically. Uh, you can select your loadout, you can jump into vehicles and so on. But uh, communication, I think that would be the most important thing. Uh, right now, I've got just chat. And eventually have to add voice over IP, that is planned, of course, uh, as well as pinging. That's sorely missing right now, quite frankly. But uh, apart from that, from the commander's perspective, the commander, of course, should also be able to, to ping uh, uh, as well as talk over, talk, talk over the uh, microphone as well. But uh, giving orders to units, you know, the way I decided to go is that players from the perspective of a commander are just the same as any other unit in the way that you command them, right? So you select a, a human player, you select another soldier, it's the same thing, and you give them an order. Uh, what to do, where to move, what to attack, and so on. And the players see that as, you know, commander's orders, do this. Uh, 
So uh, in this regard, it's very fluid in the way you command everything for, for, uh, from the commander's perspective, because otherwise, if you know there was a completely different system, it would be quite frustrating. So there was, it was a kind of natural outcome of, um, of uh, combining the two together. But uh, communication still has to be worked on. There has to be, uh, like I mentioned, I still have to add in voice over IP and uh, pinging for both commander and for um, uh, infantry. Cool, thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. That's going to be nice. Uh, and my last question would be, um, what challenges brought the like AI com to the AI commander? Like, were there such challenges connected with that, with like AI at specifically for the commander? So, doing a AI commander is, you know, it, it, there are a lot of challenges. Um, uh, the main thing is, I didn't want to use behavior trees for this because you're limited to what's in the behavior tree. I decided to go with more of a priority-based system where it evaluates, evaluates the battlefield, um, evaluates, all right, you know, there's some enemy units over here and groups them, of course, so it's not one individual one. Enemy buildings over there and so on. Uh, I have, you know, those Balterium fields or potential positions for Balterium fields, uh, potential positions for bunkers and so on. And it just creates a list based on, based on distance, uh, uh, you know, how important whatever it is is so for example if i'm if i if i only know of one bolterium field then finding another bolterium field you know is a higher priority so logically i would put that into the queue with a higher priority and therefore then i go at the end of the like getting all of these uh the situation reports you could say i then go and uh, evaluate them with starting with the highest priority and going downwards mm -hmm. so it, it, the, the biggest problem with this is that this system starts working only once you have everything done. <laughs> because otherwise, uh, you know, soldiers will get ordered to attack. Oh, attack the base, attack those units, attack those. But if you don't have defense written, then all of your soldiers just disappear attacking and no one stays to defend. That's one of the problems, in fact, what happens now to a degree. Um, uh, so I still have to finish, of course, defense and so on. But this is one, this is one, of, the, uh, one of the problems with the solution I've chosen. There are, of course, you know, different, different solutions. One of the best solution would be, one of the best solutions would be to go with um, uh, machine learning. But that's not exactly an easy thing to do. One, two, uh, uh, two it would require a large amount of data, um, uh, especially for, you know, per location and so on, that it would just become insane. And plus, you know, it would eat a lot of performance and so on. So it was no need. So there was no need to do that, at least not for now. Um, and so I kind of went with this priority based system, which is relatively easy to evaluate. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. I think that that's called closing this review. Um, I would probably like to say that it was based on the talk that you had over game access. And you also won there the editorial awards. Yes, yes, that was very nice from Vision Game. So that was very, very nice. It was a very nice event. So thank you for the talk today. And, uh, thank you. You guys can check uh, Silica on Steam definitely, and you can join our Discord where Trump is also present and answering questions. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care, guys. Enjoy.